Great. Hello, everyone. Everyone will be welcoming you in just a moment. You'll be streaming in and uh, we'll get started in just a second. We're very uh, excited to have you here today. We've got an expert panel uh, who are also looking forward to sharing their wisdom with you and also hearing you share your wisdom with us. So uh, we will just give a couple of minutes for people to stream in. I can see we've already got 50 people in there. The topic today solar and storage outlook for 2022 um, pretty interesting topic right now particularly given um, some of the market dynamics we'll be diving into that in today's presentation uh, or presentations there's a fairly packed content here and what we intend to do is make sure you're still on the edge of your seats with your attention firmly focused here. We have no long drawn out presentations as you may have come, to, come used to or come to, to hate at uh, some of these other digital uh, web events. Um, five minutes and I'm very strict on it for, for most presentations with some Q&A afterwards. We'd love to hear from you. So I'm gonna hit you up to hit us up in the chat thread, uh, kicking it off with, tell us where you're joining from, whereabouts in Australia or the world and uh, also tell us what you'd like to get out of today. Um, those chats will uh, also keep us excited, but also then inform what we present to you. If you've got any Q&As, um, particularly that we've got at the end of the session, uh, then there's a Q&A button there for you to enter those. And you can actually upvote um, some of those uh, Q&A if you've got a similar question there. Uh, so consider popping your questions in there. Um, g'day, uh, Brad from Brisbane, um, who wants to hear about stuff I do not know. I don't know what you know, uh, Brad, but I can guarantee you there's, there's stuff here that nobody else knows because I only just threw it together um, this morning. And uh, so there will be certainly some, some of that. Um, we are going into uh, looking at what's just happened this year and looking at the most uh, important figures for 2021 and then what that means for 2022 from a data perspective, that's my expertise, but then we want to, we're going to actually hear from uh, various different aspects of the, the market have got different perspective and some experiential and some anecdotal. Uh, we'll be hearing from Hayden Fletcher uh, from Canadian Solar, Sophie Wright from RAVC, RAVC there you go, uh, first boo-boo of today, <laughs> RACV, and, uh, and Guy Olian from Energy Ease. We've also got a guest uh, from EUPD Research um, who uh, is going to give us a topic, which is the um, people's choice of um, brands of panels and inverters. G'day, Daryl from Hot Achuka, Victoria, 43 degrees outside right now. Um, I, I know I'm Melbourne-based, so it's also been pretty warm um, in recent days, but I tell you what, we didn't have much of a summer down here. Um, and uh, after a big long winter of lockdowns, it feels like the um, a bit, bit anticlimactic. That said, I live in a fire prone area, so I'm also very happy to not have had to evacuate it or go head to the fire bunker. Good day, good day, Harder. Um, thank you. Good to hear you joining in from Sydney. Um, let us jump into some of the most important figures for 2021 for you as well. And Michael from HCB Newcastle, uh, developing a three megawatt car, um, I presume, uh, looking for best option to sell um, power. Maybe there's a typo in there, um, but uh, I know you guys are doing some interesting stuff there at HCB. And James from Penrith, good on you for joining. Um, thanks, David. All right, let's have a look at the year just gone. There you go, Michael was talking about a solar farm. I thought he might have been three megawatt car would be an impressive one. Um, the year just gone. It was a record again. And uh, we get used to records and reporting on records in the solar industry in Australia. Um, what was interesting uh, about this record is actual growth wasn't that much compared to previous years. So we hit, uh, we exceeded the five kilowatts we did, uh, did the year before, um, but 2021 um, just nudged a bit higher. Now, it would have been higher if the solar farm above 10 megawatts had um, kept up with the pace. And so maybe, Michael, you can um, install a bit faster and, and more of those three megawatt ones. Uh, but we've actually split it out here between the um, uh, below 10 megawatt projects and the above 10 megawatt projects to really show you that behind the meter solar is underpinning the solar industry in growth overall. And that we'll also have a look at some sub 
100 kilowatt systems where most people operate, but there's a lot going in in that um, two megawatt scale rooftop market and behind the meter. And let's have a look at that now. This is a chart of the 2021 volume compared to the, uh, the growth they had on the previous year by market segment. What was interesting here is the leading market segment where most volume was got, went in was that six to eight kilowatt market and it actually contracted marginally. This is certainly you know, far less growth than it had in previous years. The big growth area, uh, particularly if you're in residential, uh, is that 10 to 15 kilowatt range. And we're seeing that people are now thinking, oh, I'm going to put an electric vehicle on in the next year or, or two. Um, and Sophie's got some questions on that later, I presume, um, from RACV, good e-mobility play. And we're even seeing Ampol, et cetera, and topic tucking into the e-mobility sort of uh, overlap with solar and EUPD has been uh, researching on the overlap between solar installers and uh, in, um, EV chargers as well for a number of years. Big trend in Germany, yet to catch up in Australia. Some of these commercial segments that were most where most growth actually happened were those megawatt scale um, market segments. I haven't noted all of them, but those are the particular ones that you want to have a look at. And then there were some other of these particularly smaller market um, commercial markets uh, segments that that grew by a slight downturn in that 70 to 100 kilowatt um, range. Prices was another big impact from the year. I'm interested to hear you hit me up in the chat. Uh, where do you where, when do you think your prices are going to reduce again? Give us a date uh, there. We'll also be hearing from Hayden on prices. But what was interesting, of course, is this uptick that we saw here in prices towards the end of the year um, that was uh, apparently drawn, driven by uh, electricity shortages or curtailment in China, which apparently was a byproduct of them refusing to uh, accept Australian uh, coal into the country due to our geo geopolitical um, tiff. So, or quarrel, shall we put it? Uh, so, uh, ironically, uh, because they're not Australian accepting Australian coal, the price of solar panels goes up. But that price had actually been rising since February or March. Now, I presume that was due to um, issues uh, dealing with freight and also just getting people around the country or city, depending on what um, lockdown you are enjoying. We'll show you some information on prices in the, year, uh, in the, the um, presentation ahead. Last year's number of batteries, we don't have a good figure on yet. This one shows in 2020, we reached about 30,000 per annum. Uh, and this year's too early to say, it's not the same definitive data source we have with solar PV, but indications are showing that it should be up uh, by 11%. Um, be interested to hear your thoughts, uh, Sophie, there on what um, people are, well, how the end customers are dealing with the choice of batteries as well. But one thing we're seeing out there that's interesting is that uh, batteries are mm, converting almost as well as uh, PV only. Uh, and there's some companies that are doing very, very high proportion of um, battery systems with their PV sales. If you've got any questions on that, there's definitely the Q&A that you can chuck those into, but um, I've got a little bit more of a presentation to go, so I can incorporate those questions in if you like. Um, so let's have a quick look at the market outlook for 2022. Uh, this is a complicated graph. Let me try and explain it to you. So this shows the um, volumes of the sub-STC market in those orange bars, and then it shows what the uh, forecast was from green energy markets in green and other consultants. And these are the people that provide the input to the clean energy regulator that sets the um, STC target. The most recent forecast for 2022, all of those analysts showed, yep, yeah, we're going to grow in 2021. So that's, that's nice. It's not a huge growth. It's not like the 30 to 50% we've been experienced in previous years, but they're all saying we'll grow something. Uh, and then there is a a slight contraction there forecast by green energy markets, but they've been forecasting the market to contract for quite some time. Um, the other analysts are predicting market growth. There's a whole range of factors in there. I'll be interested to hear from um, some of our panelists there, but you know, COVID is certainly a factor uh, and as is uh, paybacks that are worsening, electricity prices that are falling and that's having impact on paybacks as well as those system prices. There's a threat of network control and sun tax. But what the analysts are saying is, well, despite all of those worsening economics, there's just this great understanding and awareness of, of PV. And that's driving uptake in the continued sense. 
one analyst questioned, are we just seeing a, you know, will it just take some time for the public to catch up that PV paybacks are worsening, that electricity prices aren't rising anymore. Um, be interested to see uh, your, hear your experiences out there in the field. Uh, hit us up on the chat line if you're hearing any or issues or concerns or the feedback you're getting from customers, whether it be network control, SunTac, sex increasing price, or electricity prices falling. What are those, those factors are you really um, hearing about? David Leach, uh, so, um, sorry, this is an extraordinary person who contributes to Energy Insiders. Great to have you on there, David. Um, electricity prices are rising north of the Victorian border. There you go. Thank you for um, bringing me up to date on those. Um, now, uh, one thing that's worth noting before a uh, final slide for me, where we started off this year, um, 182 megawatts, which was down 25% on where we got to in January, the start of the um, January 2021. So yes, it was a slow start. Was this just because everyone was sick and you couldn't get anyone to work? Was it just because people just wanted a, a holiday from you know, COVID and just wanted to go off and um, not think about anything, um, let alone electricity bills or some other factor? Yet yeah, soon to say, but, and I'll cover off some of these leading indicators in a moment, but at least for the first two weeks of the month, February was um, below what it was um, in 2021, but equivalent levels to 2020. So we're going to launch into some panellists now. We're going to hear from them. What are the trends that emerged in 2021 that will play out for this year? Uh, what dynamics and ex sorry, expectations do you have for the market size? And what new dynamics do you predict people should prepare for? Now, what I usually do, let me, let me just take a moment, is in recent uh, webinars, I've asked uh, panellists to tell us something that uh, nobody else knows about them or the industry may not really know. And this year I decided to, instead of asking the panelists, I just asked Google what Google could tell us about um, what they uh, people knew about uh, them. And here we go, Hayden Fletcher, not quite the same spelling, Hayden, um, but uh, I did not realize that you uh, rode BMX um, bandit style for um, the Victorian Institute of Sport. Um, tell me, Hayden, um, why, have, why are you still riding um, children's bicycles? Um, oh, geez, thanks, Warwick, for throwing me under the bus there. <laughs> uh, good luck to the rest of the guys. Uh, yeah, well, who doesn't love a BMX? And uh, for those old enough that uh, know what BMX Bandits is, um, you would understand why. So, um, yes, I, I can't say I would get on it a hell of a lot these days, but, you know, why not? Share your screen, Hayden, and uh, let's hear from you. Get on the way. No worries. All right. And sorry, guys. All right. Um, well, thank you uh, for everyone for coming along. I'll try and keep it as quickly as possible, uh, but a lot to um, to really get into. Um, I suppose where I really want us to start is just a quick look back to what happened last year. And there's a lot happening in this slide, but the key takeaway is that everything's gone up in price. Uh, we can see the polysilicon's gone up, lithium's gone up, um, steel, whole range of other um, materials. It's probably nothing new to most of you, um, but it really does paint a picture of where we've come from um, over the last, uh, particularly the last uh, eight or nine months. Um, it's happened everywhere. It's not just us. And it is going to take time for things to regain that balance again. Um, with, again, a bit of a snapshot, what we've seen so far with the polysilicon, it's really jumped up through 2021. And towards the end of the year, we did see a bit of a drop. And um, having a look at the latest uh, polysilicon prices, it is starting to creep up again. And we're probably going to see this throughout the year, this up and down sort of trend. And I'll get to it a bit more, a little bit later on. Uh, but again, in particular glass, we all know about freight as well. Uh, and I've thrown this one in from today, the lithium carbonite pricing as well has completely skyrocketed um, in the last few months. So it really paints that picture of where we're at. So for 2022, is it going to be doom and gloom? I'd probably say neither. Um, we really are going to see uh, continual growth in the industry as we um, as we move through to 2030. 
Um, we expected this year to get the cumulative capacity to about one terawatt. Um, energy storage is starting to, uh, to ramp up, particularly in the utility space. Um, and we're going to see this long-term growth um, for a long time to come. So I wouldn't be too concerned about what's happening in the immediate uh, future. Now I'll throw this up there, not to have to teach you all about supply and demand. Um, we all get the, uh, the gist of it. Um, what I really wanted to point out here is we're in a fine tuned stage when it comes to uh, module pricing. And we can see in the graph on the right there, polysilicon and installation through 2021 and 2022 is gonna be very similar. Um, they're, they're pretty well balanced. Um, what you have there, uh, and with the module uh, capacity reaching around about 300 gigawatts, so it's 50% more than what the globe needs. Cells are not much far behind and wafers are not much far behind that. So you've got this supply and demand uh, game going on, not just from uh, us selling to distributors or retailers and you installers onto the consumers, it's happening all the way through the value chain. And the, there's no real reason for the polysilicon guys to drop their prices all, all of a sudden and solar panels to get back down to that low 20s that we saw uh, around about 12 to 18 months ago. So um, that's in US terms and for large scale, but um, to give you a bit of context, that's sort of, there's been this massive um, uh, price increase and there's this up and down um, supply and demand uh, game happening. Um, we man as manufacturers of modules and we do manufacture all the way through, but from the module perspective, we go from glut to short supply very quickly. It depends on the quarter, depends on what projects are happening. Um, and this really impacts all of us because um, it flows through to you know, anyone who's wanting to just pick up a handful of panels because there may not be enough manufacturing capacity available as we try and uh, plan two or three uh, months in advance. Um, really mindful of time. <laughs> Thanks, Warwick. Um, but we, we are uh, going to see this year Cells and modules uh, sizes, they are getting bigger. Just because they're physically bigger doesn't necessarily mean they're more efficient. Um, we are seeing uh, some 182s come in, some 210s will be the next um, sort of main size there. And you can see here in the graph on the right, um, a whole uh, range of cell sizes. Um, but as we get into 2022 and in the next few years, the 182 and, and 210 are gonna be the mainstream. We're also hearing a lot of, uh, about people asking about what's next from a cell type. Um, Topcon, HJT, um, I won't go into what they are, but these are sort of the newer um, old technology coming back. Um, and we should start to see these rolling out throughout uh, the year as well. So crystal ball, um, utility projects are gonna remain on the shelves for now, uh, while pricing remains relatively high. Residential, commercial, we will see a little bit of a, a bounce back post-election, maybe. Um, there is that, uh, you know, lower sentiment uh, consumer sentiment in three decades. Um, modules, again, continue to get bigger in size. The technology shift will happen. There's going to be supply chain bottlenecks still um, through 2022, less so in the second half of the year. What we're going to see and what we're anticipating is module pricing to stabilise through 2022. Um, don't expect major reductions, um, particularly as that global demand increases. So thanks, Hayden. Hopefully, work. I've made you um, proud. <laughs> thanks, mate. You done, you done well. Uh, stop your sharing. And um, yep. there's a couple of things just to note. Uh, I was running a poll during what you were presenting. Um, you can see the results on your screen there now. But most people um, are having some optimism, uh, most likely is 1% to 10% growth for the um, sub 100 kilowatt market. Um, though there are some people, and this is the first I've seen in one of these polls, predicting some downturn, possibly from January and February's figures. Still some optimism for um, some high growth there. Um, Hayden, one of the uh, questions that um, occurred in advance of the presentation was, um, do you know which are the most sold inverters and panels in 2021? Uh, square ones. Square ones. Um, rectangular, yeah. <laughs> rectangular. Um, I would I'll be guessing, I'd say, if we were talking power class, we're probably looking at around a 390 
395, uh, depending on what was predominantly available at the start of 2021. I think, but, I think, we're, I think we're talking brands, mate. You know which brand? <laughs> um, uh, was it Canadian? It might have been. You should you should uh, check check your market view subscription. I'm sure you got the answer in front of you, mate. <laughs> Just ask me. Um, and what percentage of the main uh, solar ingredients, modules, inverters, and batteries, are actually not made in China now? And will this become a critical supply issue? Uh, good question. I, I can't talk for everyone and all from a global perspective. Uh, Southeast Asia is definitely growing. Um, our capacity in that region in particular is around three to four gigawatts. Um, the, we reproduce in Brazil as well, a little bit still in Canada, but for the, the local market. Um, so um, for argument's sake, from a, a module perspective, we manufacture around 75% of our product there, but I would argue, um, as well as others, that um, there'll be more um, happening outside of China. But with China being around a 90-odd gigawatt market this year alone, there's very good reason to produce in China itself. So, um, yeah, that's uh, roundabout numbers. Fascinating. Um, Sophie Parag, Guy, have you got uh, some questions there for Hayden from his presentation? Hayden, just wanted to understand, uh, one of your graphs was around shipping costs. When do you see shipping costs stabilising? Um, for, I'd probably argue it has stabilised and it's stabilised at about two to three times the price it has been. Um, so we're seeing pricing in the order of around seven to $8,000 a 40 foot container. Um, depending on where you're getting it from, some of our uh, distributors, for example, will um, bring in a whole range of product and actually ship in more than we do. So they get perhaps slightly better pricing. Um, but while there's a huge demand for a whole range of products, I, I can't see that changing uh, in the immediate future. Um, interesting question though, and uh, funny enough, I do have a, a meeting on Thursday evening about that. So I might even try and get back to you on that. But um, yeah, I, I, personally, I don't see it uh, dropping anytime soon. Brock. Um, so yeah, Hayden, I have a question regarding uh, the supply chain bottlenecks that you mentioned. Um, and I think mm -hmm. uh, from the surveys that we've been conducting, I think this is one of the pain points for a lot of uh, people in the downstream sector. Um, so from your perspective as a manufacturer, um, are there any kind of efforts which are going on to create transparency into the supply chain? And um, if yes, how is this being addressed uh, by manufacturers such as yourself? Yeah. Good question, Parag. Um, one of the greatest challenges we, we're having um, really is it, if it's not not so much the, the, the bottleneck in getting the product out, it's being able to actually manufacture uh, enough product. Um, so to manufacture a solar panel, it's very quick and easy to set up a factory. Um, you can take, you know, you can get it uh, within six months. To set up a, a furnace to then manufacture ingots and, and from the raw material perspective, uh, it takes a lot longer. Um, so the, the challenge I think will be um, being able to lock in long-term supply contracts. Um, as one of the major players, we can obviously do that um, through our various different um, manufacturing businesses. So as I said, we manufacture cells, we manufacture ingots ourselves, and we'll bring our capacity up in those areas over time. Um, but we also have relationships with other manufacturers so that we can actually get our uh, module capacity to full production. Um, so that'll continue growing, but uh, it's really about the long-term and polysilicon, I, I was reading uh, about 90% of polysilicon produced is going into solar. The other 10% is going into your phones, your laptops, your uh, cars, a whole range of other products. And uh, we're seeing all their prices and, and those uh, companies having to lock in five, six years in advance. So um, the, the bottleneck I, really I, is in I had the capacity. Not I'll wrap you up there. Thanks, mate. I think we've no got the, the gist of it. You mentioned manufacturing. I had a poll running, um, which panel manufacturer also manufactures inverters. Uh, you forgot to mention that uh, Canadian solar uh, isn't just solar panels. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, thanks, Warwick, uh, for that prompt. Uh, so we, we have started our own uh, design and manufacturing of, uh, of inverters. 
uh, we've, we started at one end with the five kilowatts. We've, we've gone to the 125s and we'll, we'll meet somewhere in the middle depending on the region and, and the market. So we'll have our seven, eight, nines available by the end of Q2. Um, and uh, yeah, we're really trying to just diversify what we do um, beyond right. uh, just being a solar panel company. Th thanks Hayden. And you'll see, of course, that you're not the only one doing that. Um, people yeah. are correct in answering Solar Edge and uh, Hanwha also doing other things as well. Of course, you know, considerations around whether they're just white labeling or doing their own, um, but uh, appreciate the, your insight there, Hayden. Um, let us uh, take that and share my next screen. The next in uh, person to present is Sophie Wright, who I didn't know, Sophie, you're an actress um, and you were in the Australian premiere of Kinky Boots. You didn't tell me that. Oh, yes, much, much uh, hidden fact about me. Um, that's me wearing that fabulous red dress as well. Absolutely. There you go. <laughs> Sophie, cue yourself up and let's, let's hear uh, more from the, the real Sophie Wright. Yes. Just give me one second. All right, so thank you. I'm giving a retailer's perspective of 2022 and um, I'm from RACB Solar down here in Geelong. Uh, so 2022, what is it? It's gonna be um, the year that solar grows up effectively, I think. So the solar industry has experienced remarkable year on year growth with ever evolving products and solutions. And that's continued in spite of all the challenges that we know we've all had. We've been calling ourselves a new and emerging industry for a long time now as well. So 2022 really needs to be the year that we, we grow up. We've now made our mark as an industry that's here for the long haul. So it's time to really get um, serious and to be taken seriously too. So what the past two years in particular have led to is really savvy customers. They're really smart, they expect high levels of customer service and products, and they're going to do their research. So customers will drive and shape the future of the industry more than ever before um, from 2022 onwards. No longer are they going to be told what products suit them. They'll be shaping the product market and demanding excellence in both product and service. So we're going to find that they're really opinionated. They'll compare, they'll shop around, they expect and deserve the best as well. Customers want to trust the retailer and they want honesty and they won't be afraid to pay a little more to get that as well. In 2022, for retailers to thrive at the top of their game, they must deliver on this. So right from the very initial customer contact to delivering clear, precise and accurate information to customers. And that has to be in a format that doesn't leave them confused as well. Excuse the background noise, we have installers arriving back to the warehouse. Retailers will then need to ensure an impeccable install and comprehensive handover to the customer so that they know exactly how to fully utilise their system as well. So retailers really need to see that that customer interaction is an ongoing journey. So it's not a one-off, it's, it's not a sale of solar and that's it, goodbye, thank you very much for your money. It's about providing a long-term solution so that the initial sale is actually just the foundation on which the customer will build. It might just be panels and inverter now, but consideration and conversation is had with each of those customers on their future needs. So while this might be designed to suit them right now, it can be built upon in the future. So there's a plan and the customer knows that because there's been a large degree of discussion. Maybe the family is growing, the budget might be tight right now, but what is installed can be expanded to include things like storage, EV charges, increasing electrification as gas usage declines and heating and hot water options are also replaced. So we've already seen a huge uptake in storage in the past 12 months, um, an incredible uptake really, and not because the financials make any sense usually, it's because of grid instability and customers wanting grid independence that we're seeing that. They want to be able to produce and use their own power. They're sick and tired of being at the mercy of a system that's unreliable and they don't want to give their electricity retailer the energy they produce for a pittance either. They'd rather keep it for themselves or share it with their neighbour. Customers are fed up with grid outages and they'll push for more batteries and this will also be driven by ever decreasing feed-in tariffs and competitive battery pricing too as we see more and more in the market. They really want to stick it to the distributors and retailers really and that's what customers are saying and they're going to get louder and louder as they say it as well. 
So to be a thriving retailer that responds to this new, more knowledgeable customer, retailers need to respond as well. Be curious, ask, where is this customer at? What has driven them to start researching? Where do they want to go in the future? Is this property a short or long-term plan? What changes do they foresee in, for the property in terms of occupants and usage? What are their plans for when the hot water system dies? Sow those seeds now and when this happens, your customer will return to you. Remember that this is a journey. So one of the most essential questions to ask is, have they contemplated electric, electric vehicles, either for their home or for their workplace? Um, and that's something that quite often, even for a domestic customer, you see this sort of glaze kind of, I hadn't even thought about it. Um, but we'll see a poll soon, I think, I don't know where it's going to share one, about EV charges and who is asking customers about EV charges um, yes. and electric vehicles. The, po the polls are up there right now if you haven't already uh, responded. And Sophie, just noting that um, we'll need you to wrap up in about a minute. Yes, okay. Uh, so EVs are going to be an explosive area of growth and being able to offer smart EV charging options alongside solar is essential. So you've really got to ask those questions and remembering that it's, it's the full journey. It's not just that sale. All those things will come if we talk about it um, in the right manner. So what will that lead to? Longevity in the industry. We're all really concerned about our customer and following that journey and being respectful for them. Knowledgeable customers, reputable retailers and less cowboys. I do think we'll see more regulation. We've got a lot of it, but that's going to keep on coming. Some really, really big players in the solar space, but there's still be room for small boutique in, um, retailers as well. So investing in good systems, um, a great CRM quoting tool. I'm an open solar fan girl myself. Scheduling tools, all those automation things is what you can help to provide customer service and developing great relationships with people. So people have been really shattered by COVID. We'll see a fall back to really great customer service. Don't screw over your wholesalers for the cheapest price. That's all about building great relationships as well. Um, dependable product supply and responsiveness will often win out in the long term. And again, know your products and what's coming. Be prepared to evolve as customers demand different things and products come out. Nearly there. What is my wish list? Wow, those guys are noisy today. Um, my wish list is, uh, you've heard me talk about it before, you might have seen me write about it, but my wish list is for all solar salespeople at a minimum to have CEC design accreditation. There we go. Thank you. Thank Thanks, Sophie. And if you just stop your sharing of your yeah. screen, uh, thanks so much for your presentation. What was uh, uh, interesting for me is, uh, hey, I was just recording stuff on business automation for, you know, improved customer engagement and, uh, you know, about your processes and your business and, you know, stopping having to call around your suppliers every week for a cheap price, which everyone's doing anyway, it doesn't give you a competitive advantage, and instead investing uh, in something that gives you a dividend again and again and again, which is that, that business automation and, uh, and integration. A uh, fan, fanboy of open solar there as well um, for you. Um, ending that poll, um, it looks like there's not many people with our respondents who are actively installing EV charge points. Um, be interested to hear from you in just a sec, Parag, uh, how that compares to uh, in, in other countries, but um, you know, 13% of our um, so cost of our respondents were actively installing EV charge point. A lot of people are asking people about their um, plans for EVs and presumably that's to help them get a bigger system and sale out of this. But of those that um, are selling uh, or installing um, charges, it tends to be smart charges um, are the most likely there. Sophie, that, there's an answer to your question. Right. Um, Parag, what's, what's your perspective on what's happening overseas in e EVs? Right, so um, I think in Europe, uh, EVs are really on an uptrend. Uh, we are seeing a lot of um, charging stations being set up all across Germany, um, across other parts of Europe as well. Um, so definitely it's a big part of the portfolio of the installers, um, not only the solar installers, but also the general installers who are sort of focusing on this kind of a system together with storage. Um, so both these things are uh, pretty big on their agenda at the moment. And uh, especially Germany, um, I think that they're going great guns uh, with regards to the number of residential storage systems that they're installing year on year. Yeah, and I, you know, depending on what the price on these things are, but I've heard that some fast charges for residential applications, are, was it um, on Real New Economy, the, the bi-directional one, currently $10,000. Yeah, hard to sell a $10,000 sale, but when you do, it's great for your, um, your revenue. Uh, Guy, I think you uh, unmuted yourself to ask a question of Sophie. Yeah, just Sophie wanted to know with with those putting in storage so far, 
what percentage are doing it on a VPP as opposed to for their own usage? Yeah, I think people are getting more and more used to that idea of VPPs. They, you know, your general um, domestic installer and, and mum and dad don't know a lot about VPPs really. So I think it's really getting out there and spreading about what VPPs are about and what it means to people. Um, I think we'll see a, a, a huge uptake in VPP offerings and people being part of that. But I think it's really early days for for that sort of side of things, but that's where we'll see a really large shift to in the next couple of years. And there's, a, I mean, people have that feeling of wanting to share their power as well. Um, so it's going to be a really interesting space, I think. I'll uh, make sure I share a link on an interesting study, uh, ARENA uh, fun, uh, funded study on lessons learnt from uh, VPPs and consumers in engagement with them. And um, you, I thought initially that people would be reluctant to hand over their control of their energy independence device, um, but but turns out um, for the right financial benefit, which can be three times your standard financial benefit, um, they're willing to do so, but it's about how you communicate um, the financial outcomes that they're they're getting from that. Um, thank you, Sophie. Uh, I appreciate um, your perspective there. And Guy, um, what I found about you online when I did an image search was apart from seeing embarrassing photos of you on your family and, and Instagram is that um, since uh, being in lockdown and having to do social isolation, you, you've taken up martial arts, presumably because there's low likelihood of, um, of actually getting hurt. Um, Guy, tell us about your, your your secret shadow boxing. And, and you're muted, mate. So I don't know if you're making a funny comeback there. Sorry, when you've got a beard like that, you need to learn martial arts to defend yourself. Um, that would be my first comment. All right, uh, fair enough. But yes, unfortunately, that's the reality of the situation. But now that I've uh, I've shaved the beard, um, I've lo I've lost the skills. And um, I will introduce Guy by saying, hey, thanks, Guy's actually <laughs> come down with COVID and uh, is presenting to us despite having some pro uh, severe brain fog. Um, he's been beaten around the, the head by, by another um, invisible um, opponent. Uh, Guy, uh, sh show us your presentation and let's hear your thoughts. Yeah, thank you uh, very much. So, um, look, just quickly wanted to share what we see as the drivers of commercial solar. Uh, we really see the commercial market, which, as you said, um, has had some really strong growth actually in the last few years, as being driven by three major elements. So one is affordability. One is this incredible growing pressure in the boardrooms around uh, ESG governance, which stands for Environment, Sustainability and Governance. And the third is uh, access to funding and the ability to um, to transact easily. So the first one is that despite the, the recent uptick in prices, which Hayden spoke about and obviously you've spoken about, long term, solar has become radically cheaper than it ever was, which is no surprise to anyone, but we're talking 100% sort of reductions over a nine-year period or 10-year period. And even though prices have bumped up, relative to where they've come from, they're actually still incredibly uh, cheaper than they were. And the importance of that is that when you combine that price reduction with what is now, in essence, the world's greatest source of managed investments. So now one third of all assets under management globally have some sort of ESG filter applied to it. So that means that the managers on publicly, the, the managers of uh, financial instruments that then go into boardrooms and advocate for change amongst some of the world's largest companies are really pushing those companies with the weight of their money. Now, where that used to be a small, annoying type investor, this is now the world's most serious investors and the world's largest investors pushing the world's largest companies and it's flowing all the way down to smaller suppliers and it has happened at the rate of knots. And last year's COP was just another iteration of what's been happening. So we are now looking at give or take one third of all assets under management globally, and particularly more so in the US, having some sort of ESG filter applied to it. It is then pushing everyone into, well, what's the most important issues for me as an ESG investor? And lo and behold, the most important issue, and this was in 2020, and I'll give you a 2021 update, 
the most important issue in 2020 was carbon and climate change. So what are you as a company doing about your carbon and climate change uh, issue? The Australian Institute of Company Directors ran a research piece in December here in Australia. And again, 70% of all company directors in Australia listed climate change as a key risk. And the, the counter of that is a huge amount of directors genuinely want to make a difference, but also genuinely don't know what to do. Uh, on top of that, they're making all these announcements about net zero 50 or 2050 that is, and we're having a game of catch up, like holy, we just made this announcement. Now we've got to backpedal like crazy to make it happen. And so to support effectively what, um, what Warwick has shown before, you're now seeing that almost 50% of all the solar installed is in these commercial spaces. Now that obviously includes utility scale and Warwick, I know that had certain large projects fallen in one way or another, it would have a major impact. But if you just look at the last four years, 2018 onwards, literally every year has been give or take 50% is in commercial, right? So somewhere between 15 kilowatts to that um, major utility scale stuff. So all these things are really starting to drive. And what we're now seeing is that for a commercial company, the ability to do it without funding options is becoming critical. This is not a plug for us. This is a fact that most companies are now considering these options as well as things like PPAs, which are a newer avenue of funding solar where you can effectively lock in cheaper rates. And this is goes back to the issues around affordability and ESG and how do I make this happen? So overall, I think I'm pretty much on time here. Um, we expect the market in commercial to still grow in the order of 10 to 20% uh, as opposed to that broader overall number, which is kind of, I think you guys are talking about a 10% market, but in the market segment that we work in, we think that will still have some strength. And I think that kind of loosely realigns with what you're saying, Warwick and Hayden as well. Thanks so much for that, Guy. If you can uh, stop the share of your screen. Um, we've got a poll up there, uh, still opportunity to put your figures in there. You'll be happy to know preliminary figures yet, Guy, um, are recommending that people use energy ease, but uh, more so than a, another commercial finance specialist. We'll see um, where they pan out at in the in a moment um, with more people going to um, comment on that, that poll there now. Um, yes, I, I made a comment in the uh, chat that um, that corporate ESG, um, I was speaking with um, the clean energy regulator the other day, and they're noticing a huge, um, hugely greater volume of um, transactions in the voluntary LGC market. And that is popping popping up the LGC price because it's already, you know, pretty much in tight supply demand balance. So, uh, you know, even yeah, if it's not seeing... for a direct sale, you know, people are buying LGCs to, to achieve some of these things. It's uh, VIX, it's ACUs, it's LGCs, it's international offsets. The whole market in the last six months, internationally and domestically, has rapidly accelerated. And again, this is kind of driven effectively by voluntary corporate commitments towards net zero. And uh, that includes the use of offsets. Yeah, look, and this is something which I think is going to continue, but, but clearly the, the most sensible investment is to, if you, if you can put it on your own roof, right? Um, and depending upon the cost of capital, it's, you know, it can be sensible to, you know, generally producing um, returns. This applies to residential as well, but from a commercial lens, if the cost of capital is less than the, the money that you're getting from some, getting return from your solar system, then you may as well use someone else's money to make you more money and have more in your back pocket. Um, I presume there's more sophisticated and nuanced ways of selling um, th than that. Um, Hayden, uh, you, you guys have been active in the, the commercial or the, the large scale space as well. Um, any, any comments or questions there for, for Guy there? Um, oh, not so much um, any, any questions there, but uh, I suppose um, probably less so commercial from a rooftop commercial sector, but certainly from a whether it be small solar farm or large um, utility projects. Um, as I 
sort of touched on earlier, there's certainly going to be quite a few um, projects that are that are shelved for the short term, but hopefully by the end of this year, early next year, we start to see a lot of that come to fruition. And th there's plenty of um, of companies out there that that want to do it, um, particularly over the next two to three years. So yeah, I, I agree that there's going to be a lot more to come. Great, thank you. Now I close off that poll so we can see some results there um, of the 35 people who responded. Uh, a quarter are don't sell commercial PV. Um, most uh, of them that uh, do recommend some finance, uh, recommend energy ease, you'll be happy to see a guy. Um, and uh, those that do recommend finance, most of them don't just leave them to you know, sort out for, for themselves. They do direct them in a certain d d direction. Um, generating commercial leads, for many people is a passive, just whatever comes in um, approach. And to me, uh, in a market segment, which has got some significant growth potential for many, many years ahead, um, just sitting around waiting for commercial leads is probably um, not the most mature uh, approach. Uh, it's pretty straightforward to cross promote your commercial services to your residential customers, many of whom may be business owners themselves. Um, but there is a fair chunk that are actively seeking out commercial um, prospects. I wonder exactly how they do that because you can do a big scatter gun and that's not necessarily the um, going to deliver you a highly efficient thing or you could target it to the um, locations that are buying most PV people can see it around them and more likely to buy you can target to the right businesses that are in the right business segments um, guy there's a question up here um, which industry segment do you think buys most commercial pv um, most people uh, well half of respondents thought it was manufacturing um, with followed by uh, you know, equivalently retail trade then construction and agriculture um, you got a question get an answer for us here yeah look uh over the last few years, we've seen an unequivocal trend towards agriculture um, and, and all the related industries around it. So from, from food production in terms of um, at, the, at the farm level to packing sheds to food manufacturing, but that vertical has been heavily um, skewed towards uh, the adoption of renewables and in particular it's driven by those large corporates being Coles, Woolies and Aldi pushing it down into the supply chains. Right and look uh, I think you know this answer because you're tracking it with um, the companies you finance. Um, worth noting that uh, anyone who's a, a client of energy ease of, of a certain volume is going to have a special offer to them to help them know which industries are most actively um, seeking solar and that's a, a joint partnership effort between energy ease and sunwiz um, sunwiz can extend that to help you also identify the right postcodes provide you a database of businesses uh, to uh, approach in those right postcodes and segments and uh, give you some other market trends and other information there as well um, Guy, there's a comment uh, question there for you in the comments in the chat. So while I jump into, um, actually, I will also paste the link to that VPP um, lessons learnt. That you can no problem. But yeah, Kirk, uh, we are uh, Guy, starting if you can, to see... Sorry, Guy, I'm going to move on with the presentation. If you can type I'll it in. I'll respond in writing. No Thanks, problem. Thanks, mate. Um, I will give you a jumping in now in two next bit of the presentation, pardon me. So we started mentioning about some market intel to help you win in 2022, and that's particularly for commercial. And I'm gonna run you through some other things which can help you uh, with this market, with your broader market segment. One thing Sunwiz has been focused on very much recently is addressing the issues we've been hearing for the last decade from solar retailers. And that's the, geez, there's not enough time in the day. Geez, I'm being undercut by uh, all these people um, and uh, the customers don't, aren't willing to pay or don't understand why they should be paying the, the higher price that I'm worth. Um, and all that feeling is generating a feeling of being stuck and can't get ahead no matter what their efforts do and we've come together with a solution uh, and that is a holistic solution and i'm going to break that down into a few things that the solution's got to involve um, differentiation you've got to look different to your competitors and racv cv solar does a great job of doing that both through brand and um, how they approach it um, it has to involve automation so if you talked to that previously and then also some guidance so how you should be navigating this um, highly competitive battlefield 
Within guidance there, you need some reporting. So you need to understand the map. Uh, you need some, some training, to, especially with regards to sales, and you need some advice from a coach. And within reporting, what you wanna know is how to set your price right, um, how to concentrate your efforts well, and how to get some feedback. And I'm gonna give you um, those answers right now. What margin should I charge? This is a chart which shows the range of different margins out there in the market and their equivalent markups, depending on how you think. Um, the typical business is operating at about an 18% margin, profit margin, it's a gross margin. That's equivalent to a 22% markup. This number does change over time and recently appears to have come down a little. But what's interesting here is it's really influenced by business strategy. And we see, yes, there are those um, high volume, low margin businesses and those um, you know, low volume, high margin businesses. But then there are some businesses that are really trying to just doing it tough on low volume and low margin, doing a bit of a me too, struggling to get whatever they can. And then there are the unicorn businesses, typically doing medium volume with high uh, margin. And um, I, I know Sophie's been associated with some of those businesses um, previously. Um, the, the, the lesson out of this is always pick sensibly, like pick your margin smart to adopt the business level, business model that you want. There's uh, more detail in a full report. Next question is, of course, you need to also keep an eye on prices, uh, what's been charged out there in the market. So you do remain competitive, both looking internally at your own business and your goals, but also what else is happening out there in the market. And so here's a list of prices there uh, that are being charged most recently for 6.6 .6 kilowatt systems. It's actually national, not, not in Queensland. Um, and that's broken down by um, uh, panels and inverters. Um, again, if you're, we've got a, a service there that will localize that for you and even give you at the combination of panel and inverter prices of what's being charged out there in the market. But there's a huge range from a, a what been typically charged at 63 cents per kilowatt hour up to an end phase at $1.63 per kilowatt hour. Uh, and that has a varying impact upon people's revenue and profitability, um, as you might expect. Uh, but even within a particular product, and let me just take, for example, a, Sun, a Jinlong uh, Solace at 93 cents for the typical price. Um, you know, the 25% of businesses are charging $1.17 or higher per watt for the same product or 70 cents, or sorry, 25% are below 70 cents. So there's an indication of the range of typical, if you like. Next question is how, where should I target? And for many businesses, it's just whatever comes in. But of course you have the power to be requesting leads from different sources if you're acquiring them from lead generators. Uh, and you also have the ability to go and uh, target digital marketing in postcode specific ways, or even conventional marketing, whether that be local newspapers or even, I've even seen um, people advertising on buses and bus shelters, et cetera. So, up on the screen there is a list of the top uh, postcodes at a regional level um, for the past 12 months. So when I say regional, we've taken anything with starting with a 2-1 and uh, the two other digits uh, as 2-1-XX. And so you see there, Guy, um, probably close to where you live, 2-1-XX is the leading postcode in the um, uh, last 12 months nationally, or well, leading region that's uh, in the towards inner Sydney. And similarly for inner Melbourne there in Victoria. But there you go, if you're out in more regional areas, 2-5-XX is a good region to be targeting. Looking across them, still quite a number of uh, Queensland in the leaderboard, number of New South Wales as well, um, very few in South Australia. Access this data, go into the next level of detail to hone where you um, are approaching, and then also figure out what's your market share of those postcodes, or go to the next level to say, okay, what's my win rate in each of these postcodes? And should I be concentrating my effort where I'm getting greatest purchase? Or what is it about those areas, all those sales efforts that gives me greater sales? Next product, uh, next question is, you know, which product sh should I use? And one of the questions, one of the answers of, of that is popularity. So which is the most popular product? And we've got some, here's some examples uh, that show, uh, this is for Queensland in the last month, Hanwha Q cells were uh, doing best, uh, followed by uh, Canadians, uh, Canadians, um, they, they go Hayden, um, Canadian Solar, um, and in terms of inverters, SunGrow had taken the lead in recent months in that state over Fronius. Popularity is, of course, one thing you want to be selling stuff, which is people are in, in demand at the end of the industry believe is a good product. 
but people's tastes change, et cetera. So understanding loyalty is a good one. So how loyal are people to a particular product? There's met metrics for degree of exclusiveness of, install of installers for a particular manufacturer. And we see some of that in the EUPD uh, Sunways Installer Monitor, which we might hear a bit more about later from Parag. Um, but then there's other metrics on you know, how, how much customer churn are each of these manufacturers going through? Uh, you know, how, many, how many retailers are sticking with them month by month versus switching? And that'll give you an under, another indication of customer loyalty. A whole lot of other metrics as well, also in, um, mentioned in both EUPD report, uh, Installer Monitor, also there in that um, LinkedIn newsletter that we are publishing now. And then directly questioning what the uh, install, what the retailers and uh, installers think of each product and looking at the answers. Next question is, how am I doing? Some people think their business is going amazing because their volume is growing only to realise that the market's growing faster than them and they're actually falling behind. Others are just, just riding and coasting on the wave of growth rather than it being something to do that that they're doing in particular. And then when the wave starts to crash, uh, then businesses realize, well, I haven't done anything that sh that's helping me to stay above the market at this point. So having a look at here at an example of the, a particular business there and its market share uh, on a monthly basis across its different states and segments and even its ranks. So, you know, this company was doing pretty well, but had a very quiet December, for example. Next layer down is actually doing those business analytics on your own business to understand which are the product combinations that are working best for you. And we see it often that um, businesses may be leading with a particular product combination um, but then, and then you know, following with a second product combination, but actually selling more of that second product combination. And you go and say, well, how about you switch your efforts and attention to promoting that first? Your sales will lift naturally. Similarly with salespeople, locations, lead sources, segments, a whole range of different uh, assessments that you, know, you can do uh, through some business analytics. We can help you if you're on open solar there and doing that. Uh, but again, that makes a difference in, in helping your decision-making so they're concentrating your efforts on what you do best and understanding why. Next thing is you've got some cash in the bank. Should you be uh, you know, holding on to it and uh, to, to, to ride through a downturn or should you be investing that to um, grow your business as the market grows? Here are some leading indicators of what's happening on the market. This one here is the weekly volume of solar quotes um, that get uh, go through the solar quotes network. And you see naturally they dipped in at uh, Christmas time, but we're on a pretty uh, downward trajectory through the back quarter of the year, rebounded, and now have cooled back again. In from an annual perspective, um, they were far below what they were in 2020. Um, so this sort of indicates why some of the data I showed you earlier suggests that you know now's now's the time to be sensibly investing your money um, rather than just um, throwing it at what, whatever you can or being inefficient. Um, now's a good time to be um, becoming a very efficient and effective business. Uh, if you want to know more and you would like to have some market intel delivered to you each month that is particular to your industry segment and where your focus of your operations are, informs your business. We've actually gone and made that uh, hyper affordable. It's available from as little as 500 bucks a year for most SMEs. In fact, if you're on open solar, um, you can access an uh, even greater amount of market intel and it's priced at a per project basis. So it's really just about how, um, how much volume you're putting through. If you want to know more about that, then please comment in the chat SME and we will send out some more information for you. If you're a large business, then you might be a commercial retailer. I've mentioned some of the things that we're doing there with Guy and um, what we extend upon that to help you uh, focus your attention where it's best placed. Um, then if you can comment commercial in the chat and we will send you some information. Uh, and then if you are a large manufacturer, we have a service for you as well or a wholesaler as well. Um, and that's called Luminate. It's very, very excited about um, an upgrade to all of our intelligence services. Comment, comment Luminate in the chat and we'll get some information out to you. Um, let me wrap this up where I began and say, 
solving all those problems. One of the things that we see that is with these businesses is they're time poor and they don't necessarily have the uh, know-how and resource to implement all these things that Sophie was talking about before. Um, maybe don't have the same uh, sized organisation and, and firepower behind them. So uh, this is where we come and produce a, don't DIY, we will do it all for you integrated solution. So if you're interested in an effortless business evaluation, then please check out Sunbiz Accelerate. Type Accelerate into the uh, comment and we will send you some sample of that information and the process we lead you through and with a very dedicated focus on your business uh, to identify where your strengths and weaknesses are and address some of those weaknesses and, and amplify some of those strengths. Uh, would be fabulous to work with some really good quality um, businesses to help transform your business this year. So let me uh, stop sharing for the moment and hear if there are any questions out there from our panelists. We'll have some um, Q&A from uh, people on the, the chat line as well, um, also later in the session. Um, Sophie, uh, you're, you're in the retailer space. What out of that market intel that you saw jumped out at you? Um, I just think we're very much on the same page um, with all the differentiation, like and making yourself stand out um, to really get it ahead of everything else is, is you've got to be different. You've got to you know respond to to the customers and differentiating is a really good way to do that. Um, really interesting to see the different products and, and what's leading. Um, leading the charge there. And it'd be interesting to see how that changes in the coming year as well, perhaps. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, Guy, um, from what you saw, what was um, something you took out of it? Just the, the need to systematize sales and to uh, figure out ways to self-generate either through sort of um, better data intelligence or through other processes, but, but it looks like relying on external third party generated leads seems to be diminishing. Yeah, I'd agree with you. I think the, the challenge with third party leads is that you're instantly in competition with uh, you know many other businesses. So your opportunity to differentiate before someone's um, you know, competing with potentially a shark uh, is, is diminished. So the challenge is, of course, it's hard. Most, most solar businesses are good at installing solar panels, not necessarily good at doing um, the, the marketing to generate their own leads. But the easy low hanging fruit, I think, is A, referrals. So generating referral business um, through some automations and just giving good service and B, generating more um, reviews and, uh, and ratings on Google so that you, uh, you know, when people shop around, et cetera, they're, they're more predisposed to buying from you. Uh, Hayden, did you see um, anything there that, you, uh, that, that stood out for you um, from your perspective? Um, yeah, the, the whole range of things, mate. But to be fair, I think uh, be, for, for everyone out there that is a retailer, a, just focus on what you're doing. Um, don't necessarily worry about what the guy next door does or the, the team down the road do. Focus on your business. If you need to charge more than 18%, you charge more than 18% and back it. Uh, if it's because of product or if it's because of other reasons, so be it. Um, with those prices, for example, that you had there and the spread of pricing, um, just remember as well that uh, especially at the moment where we, we've seen a bit of a dip through late December into January. There's people out there trying to clear stock. There's uh, that they maybe have over-ordered. So um, there's there's going to be times where the product is sold below cost just to get it out the door. And uh, so don't necessarily always take it as, oh, if someone's selling it, an inverter at seven cents, well, I've got to do the same. No, just do what you can. And um, hopefully you've got suppliers that are looking after you as well. Fantastic. Uh, thanks so much, Hayden. Uh, Parag, uh, we are about to um, get you, queue you up. Um, let me, uh, before we do so, um, make fun of uh, you by Googling you. And uh, I'm not sure if you know, but there is another person with the same name. Um, you can pronounce it better than me, Parag Parame, um, but uh, who listens to the uh, coughs in, in the phone, not directly with the patient, um, to detect if they've got uh, COVID. 
um, Guy, uh, that that I don't know if that's of any help. If uh, if uh, Parag here from EUPD Research can help you anyway, um, but uh, I I know he can help you decide which uh, inverters and uh, panels etc. Um, are the the best out there or the most popular. Uh, Parag, let's um, queue you up and hear from you. Thanks, Warwick. Uh, that's the first one I've come across. Uh, I didn't know there was another one that existed, uh, but uh, yeah, good to know that. <laughs> I'll Google them up next. All right, um, I'll share my screen. All right, so uh, today I want to talk to everyone regarding the various brands um, and I want to bring um, forward some insights um, through the global PV installer monitor which we have published together with Sunvis. Uh, and uh, we conduct this survey across the globe, but uh, today I would like to focus more on the Australian market uh, and giving you a perspective of what uh, is the in installers view on the PV market. So regarding brands, how they procure from various wholesalers and so on and so forth. Um, but before I get in, um, just want to uh, take uh, 30 seconds of your time to introduce EUPD Research. So EUPD Research is a market research and consulting company. Uh, we are headquartered in Bonn. Um, I am based in Dubai. Um, so we do conduct this survey uh, together with Sunwiz in Australia um, and where we are interviewing several uh, installers um, and publishing the results through the uh, Global PV Installer Monitor. We have several other products also in our portfolio um, and uh, one of the uh, certification services that we provide the top brand uh, PV seal is uh, something which a lot of manufacturers use to differentiate themselves uh, to the various retailers and installers um, to stand out and show how they are different um, and uh, talking about their USPs. We worked with several uh, tier one customers in the past. Um, some of the names are given here. Um, so if, in case there are any manufacturers in the uh, audience uh, and you don't see your logos here, please feel free to reach out to us or Sunways. We'd be more than happy to um, support you. So jumping in um, regard on the installer monitor. So um, when we talk about the installers, uh, they are basically the main intermediary between the various PV brands, um, the manufacturers and the end customers. Um, what we've seen across the globe is that uh, when we, when the installers reach out to um, the end customers, uh, we've rarely seen that the end customers ask for very specific brands. So they basically rely on the uh, installers to understand uh, which are the good brands, uh, what are their uh, USPs and so on and so forth. Um, so really the PV installer becomes a key in the buying process and based on the recommendations of the technology and the various brands, the end customers usually make their um, final decisions. So uh, the global PV installer monitor is basically giving you an idea about what the thought process of these PV installers are. Um, so if you look into the report, you will understand how they are, uh, uh, you know, uh, benchmarking the various brands. What is the popularity of the various brands in their minds? Uh, because as I said, they are the key intermediaries uh, between the brands and the end customers. So jumping into the Australian market, um, so we recently conducted this uh, primary research survey. Um, this was conducted towards the latter half of uh, 2021, um, and we completed the field phase in the month of December, and uh, the results were published in uh, mid of January, uh, where we surveyed more than 200 installers across the Australian market, and um, we uh, asked them various questions regarding their um, uh, regarding their procurement management, how they see the various brands, uh, what are their satisfaction levels with uh, the module manufacturers, the inverter manufacturers wholesalers and storage manufacturers. Um, just to give you an idea of um, how the sample looked like. Um, so since we surveyed more than 200 installers, um, about a third of them were high volume installers. So installers who were installing more than 500 kilowatts. And uh, this uh, group accounted for almost 89% uh, of the installed capacity, which was a part of our survey. 
Um, looking at the various uh, segments, um, so uh, these uh, high volume, medium volume, and low volume installers, um, as Warwick pointed out, uh, the residential segment and the small commercial segment is uh, uh, has been growing and is the dominant segment. Um, so most of these installers have been installing systems up to 10 kilowatts and up to 50 kilowatts as well. So this was the majority chunk of the, um, the surveyed installers uh, where they install their various uh, systems. Um, we also asked these installers of how, uh, what are the other areas that they are uh, focusing on, and uh, we know the uh, elect uh, EV uh, topic came up, the storage topic came up, uh, but what uh, we found out was that a lot of the installers are also providing smart home services. 18% um, of the interviewed installers um, actually were providing smart home solutions um, to the various end customers within Australia. Jumping into the uh, Australian market, um, I think uh, we know that this is a highly distributed market um, and um, through our results, what we found out at, that um, a majority of the installers in the Australian market, 88% of them uh, go via the indirect uh, procurement route, uh, which means that they are procuring majorly from the wholesalers. However, there is a, a small chunk, 14% of the high volume installers who are also focused on direct procurement from the manufacturers. Um, however, having said that, um, the low volume installers definitely depend on the wholesalers um, to bring their product into the market. Um, the importance of various aspects uh, for the wholesalers. Um, so I was uh, alluding to that question to Hayden earlier. Um, so one of the basic things that uh, the installers are always looking for is uh, reliability in terms of the delivery dates. Um, and this was uh, quoted as one of the most important features uh, when an um, installer is choosing a wholesaler. 76% of the interviewed installers uh, said reliability is a key factor on why uh, they choose a particular wholesaler, um, followed by other parameters such as uh, guarantee and goodwill and um, service, including claims management. Talking about the unaided brand awareness, so we are a market research and consulting company and unaided brand awareness is one of the important topics that we cover. And uh, based on our survey, uh, we found out that uh, when we asked installers about which are the module brands which come to their mind first, um, Jinko Solar came on top um, with 64% of the installers mentioning them, uh, at least in the top five. Um, we, I have depicted only the top three uh, module manufacturers. However, um, there are several um, manufacturers who have been de depicted in our study. Um, and you can get a complete analysis of that in the full report. But uh, tying up to this, so um, if a particular module brand comes to uh, their mind, um, it's also very common that uh, these are the same brands that they are planning to offer or have in their portfolio. So um, tying very closely to the unaided brand awareness is the distribution width. Um, so the distribution width is where um, these are the brands that they have, the installers have in their portfolio. Um, so as I mentioned, the unaided brand awareness, Jinko and Trina Solar came on top. Um, however, um, closely followed was uh, Canadian Solar. So Hayden, that's maybe a, a data point that you wanna uh, catch on to. Um, so this is how uh, basically the installers are looking at the, the various uh, brands and uh, trying to see where uh, the various brands, what is the unaided brand awareness, the marketing efforts of the various companies um, can be showcased um, through measurements such as these. Um, we also do this activity, not only for the module manufacturers, but we also do it for the inverter manufacturers. So here in this particular slide, what I have is that um, um, just like the distribution um, uh, width, we also have the distribution depth. Um, so what we mean here is that uh, based on the installer's portfolio, how many of these installers exclusively offer certain brands? Um, so what came out on top was uh, Fronius, um, so there are 17% of the installers uh, who specifically offer Fronius brand, um, followed by um, Solar Edge. Um, there are 22% of the um, installers who specifically um, uh, offer Solar Edge products, um, and followed by Sunco. Um, 
these are depicted in the dark blue. Um, the remaining are uh, either they are a dominator brand um, in an uh, installer's portfolio or they are just a complementary brand in an uh, installer's portfolio. Um, storage has been a topic world over, um, and that's uh, also the case in Australia, is what we found out. Um, and the share of installers who are planning to offer storage solutions um, compared to 2020 has increased. So in 2021, um, so this is the end of 2021, when we conducted the survey, almost 54% of the installers uh, mentioned that they would like to offer storage uh, along with the PV systems. And um, they and if they were not, um, they definitely are planning to offer them in the year 2022. So 30% of them said that they are not currently offering that, but they will uh, do this in 2022. So that's actually quite a big change. Um, the same is uh, for the solar installer as well as general installers. So there is a higher proportion of the solar installers who are offering storage solutions at the moment. Um, however, compared to the general installers, uh, the general installers are uh, on the lower band. However, um, things will change in 2022 is what we uh, foresee. Rag, if I can uh, get you to um, try and uh, wrap up in about two minutes. Yes, sure. Um, so some of the reasons uh, which we uh, found out um, as to why these companies were not offering storage solutions so far, um, I've highlighted some three reasons, there's many more. Um, so one, um, the prices were too high. Um, there, there is not a lot of technological maturity. Um, this is the perception of the installers in Australia. So that's something that uh, needs to be looked into, um, but there are several other reasons as to why they are not offering. So you will get a more in-depth overview of um, how they are perceiving storage solutions in um, the various installers are perceiving the storage solutions in Australia in our full report. Um, Unended brand awareness, again, with regards to the storage suppliers. Um, in 2021, LG and Tesla uh, were far ahead. Um, so these were the most popular storage brands um, which came to the minds of the installers when we asked them. Uh, again, um, having a, clo a, a big enough share um, over the competitors uh, in the storage space. And um, I want to wrap it up with uh, providing some highlights. Um, so as I mentioned, 12% uh, of the surveyed installers are planning to offer electromobility solutions uh, in addition to photovoltaics. Um, and by the uh, year 2022, uh, by the end, uh, almost 33% of them wanted to implement uh, these electromobility solutions. 88% um, of the uh, installers procure their modules uh, indirectly from wholesalers uh, because it's a highly distributed market. Um, and indirect procurement is also equally common uh, within the inverter space. 64% um, of the installers were able to name module brands, um, Jinko Solar, um, when it came to unaided brand awareness, Fronius was also very popular uh, within the inverter category. And uh, last but not least, 54% uh, of the uh, surveyed installers in Australia um, do offer sol storage solutions. Um, and uh, based on our prognosis or based on the sample that we collected, um, we were able to determine that uh, almost um, 2,000 uh, storage solutions were installed. So this is just based on our sample data. Um, however, the number is much higher um, since we survey only a subset of the total market. Um, however, we do believe that um, so storage will definitely take, on, uh, take off in the year 2022 and onwards. So with that, um, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Um, if you are interested in more on the analysis, the full version of the report is available. You could reach out to me or Warwick um, and we'd be happy to guide you. Thank you, Warwick. Thanks, Parag, and uh, appreciate you uh, running through some you know, very high level stuff. Uh, I've had a look at the, the report in great depth and there is a lot in it um, to the extent which I thought, okay, somebody who buys this would probably benefit from being guided through and explained exactly the opportunities. Um, for me, this is a, a report that, um, you know, really explains, you know, how to gain market share if you're a manufacturer or wholesaler or even a large retailer, um, you know, which of the products you should be uh, using and why. Uh, and, you know, complemented by some of the stuff that SunWiz does in terms of um, market share and uh, trends in that and, and some loyalty metrics. Um, we're happy to lead you through that as a special offer this week. If you comment into the chat EUPD, then we will reach out to you to um, discuss that. So, and we can also send you a redacted version of the full report. So 
Uh, we've had some questions on the chat line. Thank you for that, um, Parag. We'll come. It's one, one of them's for you in just a moment. Uh, David Pithik, um asked, what is a good referral rate in residential solar? And uh, if you can also uh, come and, uh, if you've got any other questions you want to chat in the Q&A, then please put them in now. Uh, David, I've seen businesses that operate on a 70% referral rate. Um, I was at the Solar Juice, one of their big um, kind of, or their, their you know, high volume customer um, getaways. And there were quite a few people in the audience there that were operating at 70% referral rates. Their issue was that in order to grow from that, they needed to top up, you know, that essentially for every sale, you need to be getting, you know, more than two referrals out to grow your business there. If you want to look at an R naught for the solar referral um, aspect of your business. Um, so they had to figure out how to do that in a way which still delivered them a good profit. Um, Sophie, have you got a, another answer for a good referral rate? Uh, the more the better. <laughs> as many as you can get. It's always, it's a hard thing to measure because you, know, you, you might not know that a customer has come to you from a referral. Um, you might think they've picked up the phone and given you a call. So it's really hard thing to, to get an accurate measure of. But, you know, if you can and grow that and um, word of mouth is always the best form of advertising. Yep, and uh, less low cost of customer acquisition and higher conversion rate, higher um, prices you can charge. Uh, the 70% Chris uh, Bull was the, uh, of all the leads which are coming, all the sales they're making, uh, I can't remember if it was leads or sales, but yeah, 70% of those were um, from referrals. Um, Parag, there was a question from Haida for you asking for the battery brands you showed, was it market share or brand awareness among installers, noting that some of the charts you showed were unaided brand awareness and some were um, uh, sort of market share, like how, what percentage of installers are buying for, uh, this product, um, not weighted for their volume? So um, the one regarding the storage were uh, unaided brand awareness, um, not necessarily market share because yeah, the numbers wouldn't add up. So that's definitely, uh, uh, unaided brand awareness. Yeah, and one thing I saw on that chart was that uh, Tesla was actually, you know, thought of first by more people than LG. But when you rate, uh, combine the numbers of people that th thought of LG first or second, it was actually higher than Tesla as well. So um, there's still, it's, you know, it's, it's good to be up uh, up there. Um, from Jeff Goodrich, we had a question. Uh, what is the expected level of LG Cs in the coming years? Um, I'm not sure I've got a decent answer for that off the top of my head. Uh, Guy, have you got any, uh, I, I know that the uh, mandated uh, um, surrender amount is flat now um, for, from here out to 2030. Um, so uh, that. the whole voluntary market has completely thrown out the forward curve because uh, the, forward, the, the voluntary adoption of LGCs to create net zero um, outcomes has exceeded all expectations and it is too hard to actually predict. So I think the safe the safe bet to say is it's much higher than we thought it was a year ago, uh, but we really have very difficulty in sort of forward forecasting it because it is completely driven by artificial demand as opposed to regulatory demand. Thanks. Thanks, Guy. Um, I'm just going to share a quick little slide because uh, I'm excited to data nerd. Um, we've been tracking through um, our use of software and partnerships with other um, data suppliers. What degree of churn is actually happening um, amongst, uh, for particular in uh, manufacturers of inverters and panels, um, in terms of uh, monthly recurring business from uh, un unnamed but identified retailers. And what we can see is that the uh, Goodwies, one of the leader we've highlighted here, at having a 60% of their um, monthly on month customers across a year coming from returning customers versus new customers being um, you know, over 35%, far higher than their lapsing customers that are happening. So you can see they've got a great customer retention and, and growing. That contrasts with some uh, other businesses which have a low retention rate, this one in pink, um, and, uh, and well, losing customers. So that's another little uh, indication which complements Parag's degree and depth of distribution charts. And we've got some other loyalty metrics we can share with you too. Um, all right, we've got some questions on the chat there. Um, will, we, will we be able to adopt VPPs without massive investment in upgrading infrastructure? Um, who'd like to take that question? 
Uh, it looks like there's, that's a no. Um, the, the short answer, Brad, from what I've been researching for um, my, the annual bachelor report and reading all of Arena's um, knowledge sharing, one of which I posted in the, the chat there, is that, um, look, VPPs, it depends upon the level of penetration you get there in any one particular local area. If all the um, battery fleet were discharged at one particular point in response to a pricing or a FCAS event, um, uh, then it could flood a network area uh, and you could have some issues there in terms of local voltage stability. But um, if they're distributed across a large enough area, um, then they can uh, be a very stabilizing force. So um, not particularly a massive investment in upgrading uh, infrastructure. In fact, all those batteries there in the market and the EVs there potentially can um, uh, um, facilitate increased adoption of PV, which also tends to all generate at the same time. Brad Lauder asked, um, what impact will panel recycling have on uptake? Um, Hayden, do you want to answer that? Yeah, a good question. Um... Well, we've been recycling our product uh, for probably the last five years, uh, working with the guys at Reclaim. Um, so we've been uh, one of the first few to jump on with, with them. Uh, in Australia, I'm talking, we also do it elsewhere. Uh, I'd actually like to see a scheme like we've, we've seen elsewhere where there's a, for every module that comes in, there's a small fee um, that uh, gets collected by the clean energy regulator, for example, and then um, that way we know uh, that something will be done by everyone and not just the, the few that do it. Um, I don't think it's going to have a huge impact on uptake though. I, I think it's a, um, I remember it coming out last year. It's a bit of a new story, but um, doesn't last very long, but uh, there's plenty of us that do it. Um, so a, it's a social license um, thing to, yeah. to help you continue, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, okay. So I'd, if you find that, um, you need to recycle panels or you, you're replacing panels, please reach out to at least reclaim. And there's others around uh, these days, but um, it, it is easily done. Yes, it's a little bit costly at times, but um, certainly worth it. Sure. I had another question from, question from Sammy. What do you think of ESS penetration ratio for households that already has a PV system? Um, we see that, um, well, of the number of batteries that was installed in 2020, at least it was, you know, 30,000. Um, thereabouts, uh, and there are about 300,000 uh, PV installations. So, you know, that's about a 10% um, ratio of, of, of storage to PV. Um, it's been consistently around that 8 to 12% for many years, um, whether specifically retrofit or um, uh, added to a, a new combined system varies by state and is influenced by the um, government scheme, particularly Victoria. Um, Sophie, uh, have you got any insight into uh, ESS penetration? Just noting as I asked that from the data we see, it varies widely by company, you know, with some, you know, very specific battery specialists doing, you know, more batteries than they do panels. Um, but, uh, you know, some of the, the smart ones really um, getting adoption rates in excess of 50%. Um, so what are you seeing um, out there in the market without revealing too much um, private stuff about your business? Um, yeah, I mean, it's just going to continue to grow. Um, I mean, that's a just going to happen year after year we'll see that growth just to continue and um who knows crystal ball if we get some more incentives and, and different things in the storage space as well it'll be interesting to see what happens um be an interesting year i think right thank you for that um now i get a comment there from uh mr hamid uh saying greetings from tanzania east africa Hi there, it's great to have you on board. Um, some of these big solar firms have no representation in East Africa, which apparently is the next giant leap when it comes to solar, that will be good. And I did mention here that, um, you know, somebody mentioned that uh, we've reached one terawatt of, of global solar installations here um, in Australia at a thousand watts per person. So if we can get everyone up to, to that level where we're at seven or eight terawatts globally, um, that'll mean a fair bit going into Africa. Uh, uh, Hayden, uh, Mr. Hamid has asked, uh, what plans does Canadian solar have for the East African market? Uh, yeah, great question. We are quite active there already. Uh, we do a bit of upskilling uh, and training uh, throughout Africa. So uh, shortest, quickest way to reach out to us would be to our EMEA team, uh, Europe, Middle East and Africa team. 
um, just on our website. So EMEA, um, if you uh, navigate your way through there. Thanks for that. Um, uh, Guy, any uh, last questions there? Or, no, or thank you. Uh, look, probably the biggest observation is, um, you know, uh, SMA seems to have really dropped off in uh, in inverters. Um, <clears throat> they're, a, they're a pretty substantial engineering powerhouse, so be interesting to see what their plans are um, um, yes. for this kind of next iteration of smart inverters. Yeah, we've seen that, and also there's been changes in the leadership of SMA Australia um, recently. I know Pat, Pat Diagnan took over from Michael Rutt recently, so um, we'll see what happens uh, in that space. Um, Sophie, uh, sorry, Parag, is there any other uh, comments or observations you'd like to make from today? Number one take home message. So um, I, I definitely think, um, I think the point that you brought out uh, regarding the margins of the retailers, um, I think this is really a key point and uh, I think it should be discussed more and more uh, within the market because this is not only a problem that um, I'm seeing this in Australia, but it's a world over problem and it's the same problem that each and every country uh, is facing. Um, and I think the more we talk about it, the more we uh, share the data points, uh, the more we educate the end customers, um, I think it's going to be prudent as such for the entire solar industry um, to think about. Thanks, Parag. I, it reminds me of a conversation I had with uh, somebody talking about the, the large scale solar space. It's like nobody was making money there, not the OEMs, not the you know, retailers. The only person benefiting from that is the um, end customers of general electricity. Uh, in, in PV, if you're not careful, the only people really benefiting um, from residential solar is the end customers themselves. Um, Sophie, uh, what was one of your, uh, what's your key takeaway from today? It's really great to see some of those facts and figures, um, to see the, the EV percentages. That was great you know, to get some of that data. Um, it's really nice to uh, see the validity of what you're thinking in the numbers. So um, it's a great way to consolidate things. Thanks, everyone. Great. And, and Hayden, uh, last comment from you. Number one takeaway from today. Um, I'd reiterate that, that the, uh, the data is always good to see and, and hear from uh, the different perspectives. So, um, yeah, I appreciate you getting everyone from different parts of the business on board and um, definitely a lot of takeaways from that. Great. Hey, uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, in particular to our um, audience for participating and being engaged in um, this presentation. It really gives us uh, the impetus to uh, come together and, and uh, have these chats. Uh, thank you for engagement. Thank you to each and every one of the panellists for pre uh, preparing and uh, presenting. It's, uh, it's greatly appreciated and uh, I'm really glad to have you on. And um, you know, whatever the year ahead uh, holds with regards to all the uncertainties we've been through. Uh, one thing is for certain, and that is that we are on the right side of history and that uh, for us to address climate change, we need to be actually installing uh, three times faster or perhaps even five times faster than we currently are. So even at the world leading status, um, we need each of your businesses to be operating at maximum velocity. So um, your challenge for this year is to figure out how you can uh, go two or three times faster than you are um, while still staying uh, sane, healthy and enjoying being uh, part of the solution. Thank you, everybody. Uh, appreciate you uh, joining our web event. We'll have another one for you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.